Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. And even though uh, the university is on spring break, Jenny and I are still here and we're still going to do a webinar for today. Today's going to be Universal Design for Learning Principles. We'll kind of frame this around Universal Design for Learning in a higher ed setting and then I will point out aspects and ways that uh, it can be implemented in a um, in a K-12 setting as well. My name is Jim Stahoviak. As always, I'll be guiding you through this today. and. Uh, and hopefully it's something you'll, you'll get something out of. So here we go. What we'll talk about today is we'll talk about what universal design is first because I think we have to lay that groundwork before we talk about universal design for learning. We'll talk about kind of UDL and accommodations and then implementing UDL into courses. So what is universal design? Universal design is uh, the design of products and environments to be used by all people the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation or specialized design. This is a concept that came out of uh, architecture in North Carolina State University in the 70s. A guy named Ron Mace kind of looked at things and said, you know, instead of building buildings and then having to add on these handicap accessible ramps later on that don't really look good in the in the flow of the building and maybe somewhere around the corner that's not at the main entrance. Why don't we take a look at trying to build this kind of thing in on the front end and, and making uh, making buildings, making environments accessible to everybody on the front end. When they started doing this, they found that you know even though you, you kind of think and, and aim toward people with disabilities, you, when you, you, you design toward that, you're going to have something that benefits everybody in the long run. And I guess that's probably where it comes in, you know, used by the greatest people, people to the greatest extent possible. If we're looking at folks with disabilities, we're kind of getting folks on that outer edge of, outer edge of, of ability level. And so by doing that, by getting to those edges, we, um, we're, we're making things that benefit everybody. And there's some examples on this slide of, uh, of some classic universal design examples, I guess. The, the go-to example whenever ever anybody talks about universal design is probably the curb cut. You're all familiar with those. Curb cuts uh, are on every street corner. Uh, you know, they're, they're basically a, a ramp into the street so somebody doesn't have to go over the curb to get into the street to cross. And that benefits, obviously, people in wheelchairs, but also um, people pushing strollers, people on rollerblades, people riding bikes, and older people that might struggle with taking a step down to cross the street that benefits all those folks. You're starting to see a new uh, aspect of universal design added in that to be you know, used by the greatest extent possible. And you can kind of see it on there. It's that rubber pad with bumps on it. That's there for um, folks with visual impairments that might be using a cane that aren't quite sure when they're about to hit the street that raised bump area gives them an idea that they're getting pretty close to the street. Now below that you see a house that it's hard to tell there but that has a, um, a, a ground level entryway. So even though there's, there's no step up to the, the front porch, it just kind of goes right into the door. And that is just an example to show you that that can be done without making it look like it's an accessibility thing. I mean that's still a pretty nice looking entryway to the house and it's accessible as well. Uh, next to that, you can see a fire alarm. Fire alarms didn't used to be universally designed. And not that long ago, a fire alarm code was just make sure it made noise so that people got out of the building when it went off. But you'd hear a loud beeping noise, and that was about it. If you look at it now, this one has a, a strobe light on it. And anywhere you look, you're going to see that. It's code now to have a strobe light on your fire alarm because with just the noise, how would somebody who's deaf know what was going on? How would somebody who's deaf know to get out of the building or get out of their dorm room or, or whatever when a fire alarm went off. So that, that strobe light indicates that the alarm is going off for somebody who might be deaf or have a hearing impairment. And if you listen to these now, they don't just give a loud beeping noise either. If you listen to them, they typically give you instructions on what to do. I know in our building when the fire alarm goes off, it says there's an emergency, get to the nearest exit and get outside. You know, that might help people that struggle with uh, panicking when they just hear loud noises, giving them some idea of what to do to get out of there. So it's really become, to uni become a universally designed tool. If you look next to that, signage, that universally designing signage is helpful as well. Uh, that's a sign obviously for a women's bathroom. If you just had the word women up there, uh, somebody who's blind, somebody who has a learning disability, somebody who doesn't speak English, isn't necessarily going to know what that word says. And that could lead to some big issues if they happen to go in there. Um, but if we put a symbol on there that's universally recognized as well as braille underneath the word, all of a sudden we've made signage that's accessible to 
uh, to just about everybody in that respect. So that's the, the concept of universal design is that it's, it's um, designing an environment to make them accessible to everybody. So kind of keep that in mind when we talk about universal design for learning and what universal design for learning is. Well, this is what it is. It's a goal. It's a process focused on planning. Really, the, the key to universally designing something is to thinking out ahead of time what issues people might have uh, with accessing your class and then designing those designing workarounds around those issues, I suppose. You know, it's an idea that you know, not everybody learns the same way and that multiple approaches might be needed to reach everybody in your class. It's a proactive process. It can be implemented in steps. The key to this is also it's accessible, it's usable, and it's inclusive. So if you universally design a class, it's accessible to everybody. Everybody can use it, and everybody's included as well. It's, an also, it's also a way to extend some of the benefits of accommodations that are pretty common for folks with disabilities to everybody in the classroom. Uh, and, and anybody, there's, there might be some people that don't have disabilities, but learn a little bit differently than others and can benefit from some of those accommodations. So we can do that. Uh, it's extend the benefit of those accommodations through UDL. Also, it allows for students to use their strengths to access the class. That's also another key about this, is tap in to the strengths of an individual and, and give them the opportunity to use those strengths to maximize learning and maximize understanding of things as well. What universal design for learning is not, is it's not groundbreaking. Hey, you know, nothing that we're going to talk about here is, is groundbreaking stuff. It's not a single solution. There could be multiple solutions here. Um, in, in the college setting, we talk about UDL. Folks are, think it might be a, a means to lower quality or standards or a means to make class accessible to unqualified students. That, that's not the case either. Uh, there are standards to get into classes that need to be met. What we're doing with universal design is once you've qualified for those classes, uh, we're making it easier to use your strengths to benefit from those classes. So we're not lowering any quality. We're not lowering standards. We're not uh, making it accessible to unqualified students. You know, universal design isn't necessarily completely required in every class either. There's still some things that are um, that are accommodation based that the student or the student will have to work with the student disability services or something else to get that taken care of. For example, it's not practical to have a sign language interpreter in every classroom just in case you run into a student that has a hearing impairment that might need a sign language interpreter. Um, that's still something where that's on the student, that's on the, the university, that's on the school to get that accommodation when necessary. And finally, universal design for learning is not a replacement for good teaching. It's, it's really a complement to good teaching. It's, uh, it, it's a way to help extend uh, the good things that, that a teacher is doing in the classroom. Universal design for learning comes out of uh, some brain research that was done at the Center for Applied Special Technology out of Harvard. And what this looked at was, was three primary brain networks in learning, the recognition network, the strategic network, and the effective network. And what they saw with this when they looked at these networks from, for different individuals is that different people, their networks work a little differently. The recognition network is a network that, um, it's the network in the brain where we take in information. And what we saw here is that people take in information in different ways. And so what the folks that kind of came up with the concept of universal design for learning said was because everybody takes in information differently, what we need to provide to our students is multiple means of representation of the material. So some people might you know, take in information by um, listening to a lecture, others by reading, others by watching a video. If we provide all of those options, that gives users a choice to be able to access the information in the way that best benefits them. The middle network there is the strategic network. With the strategic network, that's the area where we kind of plan and demonstrate what we've learned. Uh, so that's, you know, every, and everybody does that a little bit differently. So universal design for learning calls for providing multiple means of expression for students. So, uh, you know, not everybody is great at writing an essay, even though, you know, you're going to have to do all these at one time or another. Not everybody um, displays what they've learned best by writing. Other people might do it better by presenting. Other people might even do better by singing a song about what they learned. What the strategic network and having multiple means of expression indicates is that we should provide multiple ways for students to demonstrate what they've learned. And the third area there is the effective network, and that's kind of where we're engaged in learning. 
And again, everybody's engaged a little bit differently. So to provide multiple means of engagement to students, we provide multiple ways for students to kind of get interested in learning and, and, and really sit down and dig into things. Uh, one of the examples that's given in, in something like this in, in maybe a K-12 setting is, you know, maybe if you're doing a report on different states and, and everybody's got to pick a state and do a state, maybe if you approach it as, um, Instead of uh, instead of you have to learn about a state and give a report, maybe approaching it as uh, you're going to become an expert on your state and you're going to teach others about that. That gives the student a little bit of a sense of ownership in what they're doing, and and that might be one of those ways that engages them a little bit differently. So thinking about things in terms of that, in terms of engaging students, would be the third way uh, to implement universal design for learning. So those are your three hallmarks for universal design for learning: multiple means of representation, multiple means of expression, and multiple means of engagement. And this image comes from uh, the CAS website here. So why is it necessary? Well, uh, I want to talk about why it's necessary at a college level, why universal design for learning is necessary at a college level. Um, when you come to college, you're no longer, the IEP doesn't come with you. So if you were a student in special education uh, in, in K-12 settings, you had an IEP that listed out all your accommodations, teachers had to follow those accommodations and, and make things accessible to you in your classroom. When you come to the K-12 level, that is no longer the case. The teachers don't have to follow an IEP. At this point, the student becomes responsible for self-identifying that they have a disability, working with student disability services, and, um, and getting the accommodations that they might need. Well, we did, here at the University of Iowa, we did a, a, an accommodations needs assessment uh, a couple of years ago where we basically uh, sent out a survey to everybody on campus, and we asked them, what uh, if they had a disability, and, and we had 10 to 12 percent indicating that they had a disability, which is about what we'd expect, because that that kind of flies with the national average there. But part of the reason we did this is because when we talked to student disability services and asked for how many people they had signed up with them, we were hearing things like you know 400, 415. That's certainly not 10 percent of the population of students at the University of Iowa. So we were wondering what the issue was. And so when we asked if they had a disability, the next question was, uh, were they registered with student disability services? And we found out that you know, almost 60% were not registered with student disability services. And most of the people that indicated they had a disability indicated that they had an invisible disability of some type, whether that be you know, learning disability, emotional disability, something that a teacher wouldn't be able to look at them in the classroom and understand why they might be having some issues. And so we found kind of what we suspected that on campus here, there's several students with invisible, with some type of disability running around on campus that aren't getting help from student disability services and we have no idea if they're struggling, if they're doing well or, or, or ways that we can reach them uh, right now to, to make things easier for them. So. That's why we kind of decided to focus on universal design for learning here on campus. If we can universally design classes, it shouldn't matter if these students are going to student disability services. The accommodations for most people with high incidence learning disabilities ought to be built right into class. So what about universal design for learning? We're focusing a lot on, on um, uh, on disabilities. Obviously it helps students with disabilities, but it can also help all students. Uh, it can be beneficial to students with language differences. I mean, we talk about uh, in the early going there, multiple means of expression, multiple means of representation. You know, if we have students with language differences and all we're doing is speaking and there's not some kind of text that they can take a look at, maybe we're speaking too fast. Maybe they can't keep up with class that way and they might do better taking in information in a different medium. And so that, you know, universal design for learning could help those students. Students with cultural differences, uh, you know, in a college setting, you may find that some cultures, students don't want to go ask for help if they need help because they don't want to sit face to face with an instructor and ask for help. Maybe providing different ways for them to access um, instructor's time through maybe an online chat might be something that they could do uh, and that would benefit all students. Uh, students with learning differences, again, universal design for learning, it just provides multiple ways to learn. So some students might be visual learners, some students might be auditory learners, some people might learn by doing things, uh, by universally designing a class. We're providing access to all those different types of learners. And then 
This is especially the case in the university setting. Students that might need to miss class for various excused reasons. You know, not every religious holiday is taken off by the university. Not uh, Veterans Day is something where we have a lot of veteran students that need to miss class. And if they miss class and it's still a universally designed class, they should be able to not miss too much information, be able to get things back, uh, get things back in order when they when they are back or when they're available to to be able to do that. Um, at this point, I would typically show a video uh, that kind of shows some of the importance of uh, multiple means of engagement, multiple means of representation, multiple means of uh, uh, of expression. But I'm not going to embed this in, in the, into the YouTube uh, archive here. So if you if you would like to take a look at this, it's a very good video put out by Kansas. Kansas State University. It's starting to get maybe a little bit dated now. I think it came out in 2007. There's the link for you right there. If you don't want to type that whole thing in, if you go to YouTube and search for a vision of students today, you will get the video that, that, we're, uh, that we typically talk about here and, and, and take a look at kind of what students are looking for. And this really kind of hits on, um, this video really kind of hits on the need for engaging students using their technology that they're familiar with today, engaging students um, a little bit differently, going beyond what's in the textbook in a class, uh, just providing a meaningful experience for students. And to some instructors, it comes off as students being a little bit whiny and wanting, uh, wanting more than uh, or wanting the, the, the instructor to come all the way and meet their demands when really, I mean, it does show, it, it, may, it may come off a little bit that way, but it really just shows different ways to implement things in the classroom or what, it, it, it brings up issues in a classroom that, that instructors need to, uh, need to work with today, especially when it comes to technology and it comes to uh, basically having students that have had the computer and access to internet their whole lives and the ability to get information fairly easily and it wants you to it wants instructors to start thinking about ways to incorporate that kind of technology into the classroom and and go beyond what a standard lecture might uh, might entail. So it's a good video. Check that out and and take a look at um, take a look at that before going on any further in this webinar. So let me talk a little bit about incorporating universal design for learning into college classes, and we'll also hit a little bit on uh, doing that in K-12 settings as well. In college settings, we talk about three areas where you can implement UDL, and that's in the classroom environment, the class presentation, and what we call the class materials, which is kind of a catch-all for everything else, including supports, assignments, assessments, so on and so forth. Um, the class environment, there's two big areas that we can hit there. It, it's, it's kind of the, the, feel, the general feel of the class as well as the physical environment. The class presentation, we kind of talk about, first of all, determining what's essential to the class so that we can, um, we can present things in different ways and then varying methods. And in class materials, we talk about providing supports to our students as well as um, assignments and assessments and how we're going to kind of uh, address those in the class. Let me talk first about the syllabus. Um, why is this important? Well, typically it's your first contact with students in your class. And what we suggest that um, instructors do with this is provide information in at least two formats. Uh, so we could provide information in, in both, a, typically a syllabus is just going to be a list of things that need to be done or things that happen throughout the class. But maybe providing a visual calendar in there as well with, um, do, with um, the dates that things are due, having that plugged into the calendar so somebody that's more of a visual student can kind of see that laid out and be able to organize things a little bit better. That might be able to, that might be a, a positive thing as well. You know, you want to clearly explain the goals of the class so every student understands what's coming up, clearly explain the assignments. We also talk about providing multiple contact points and that gets back to the fact that we need to operate within the technology students use today. We also, we also need to operate within the, the manner that students kind of feel uh, feel comfortable operating. And, and if we look at kind of the way some of our students communicate now, um, email isn't all that popular anymore. There's not a whole lot of students that would say that email is their preferred way to communicate. Most students, their preferred way to communicate is through social media or through text messaging. And so is there ways that we can kind of incorporate some of that into our classroom to provide uh, to provide ways that everybody can can reach the teacher, and one of the things that we suggest is um, 
continuing to have office hours, continuing to provide phone numbers, email addresses, and so on and so forth, but also maybe having um, online office hours where students can sign into a chat area, whether that be um, through at the University of Iowa, through the ICON uh, course management system, or through something else. And they can type uh, questions to the instructor and the instructor can answer them that way. Not only does that help our students that might be more interested in technology and, and be more comfortable texting or, or typing, that might benefit um, some of our students with disabilities uh, that, that might um, not want to come to come to the professor's office to interact with them. Maybe you know you had a student that had a hearing impairment that might struggle with communicating face to face. Communicating via text might be a little bit easier. So providing, opening that up and providing that access to everybody, again, provides multiple ways that students can, can, can message you uh, using their preferred means of technology and, and allowing them to use their strengths to reach you. Um, you know, we, we talk about providing information on helpful resources as well. And that's typically a list that we give instructors on free or inexpensive assistive technology tools that students can download to help access their class. A lot of students aren't aware that these, some of these things are available. So if an instructor kind of incorporates that into a syllabus and says, you know, if you struggle with reading or would rather listen to text, here's a tool that could, uh, that you, that could allow you to read or, or that could allow you to listen to your text readings. Here's a tool that could allow you to convert things into an MP3. Um, that's, that's the first step in providing awareness to students that some of these things are available. We also talk about, uh, well, I guess at a college level you have to include a disability or accommodation statement on your syllabus. Uh, well, we, as part of that, um, that survey that we showed you before, one of the questions we asked when we sent that to faculty was, do you include a disability statement on your syllabus? And that's required by the university that you do that. And we only found that about 75% actually do. So you know, there's, there's some folks that we need to get this a little bit more in front of them that they're, uh, to make sure that they're, they're doing what they need to do in terms of um, providing an accommodation statement. But when we say, when, we, when you talk about that, there is university language that you need to include, but we also say, you know, include personal values into that as well. You can, you can add to what the university has in there, saying something about, I appreciate diversity in learning, I'm willing to work with a student that has a disability. By doing that and providing that kind of language, what you're doing is really setting up a student to, um, to feel more comfortable to come and work with you and open up about some, some of the issues that you might have in class. Excuse me. Here's an example of what we would include in a disability statement. You know, an appreciation for diversity. You know, I appreciate diversity in learning. Understand that some of you may have difficulties accessing pieces of this class. You provide an invitation to meet in, a, excuse me, in a timely manner. You know, here basically saying they'd like to hear from anyone who has a disability that may require some accommodation in terms of seating, testing, or other class requirements as soon as possible so that appropriate, appropriate arrangements may be made. You certainly do want to make sure that's in a timely manner. You know, give a date, give a time, you know, give some kind of time frame there. Um, you know, you do want to encourage your students to register with Student Disability Services so that they're definitely getting all the academic accommodations they need. And then uh, reiterating a, a invitation to meet, you know, do not hesitate to see me before or after class or contact me using the information provided on the top of your course syllabus. That really just opens up and provides, creates a welcoming environment for all of our students in the classroom. Although, Having a disability statement isn't necessarily enough. Another way to signify that it's important to you is, is, is through discussing that statement. So you know, what this does is, again, it signifies that it's important to you, it speaks to your acceptance of disability, indicates a willingness to, to, trust, uh, to work with your students, can kind of create a, a trust with students. This really can also be used as an open invitation for discussion with your students. And it really does make it more likely that the students can approach you to work with you on, on issues. And you know, another thing you can do to create a welcoming environment, you know, early on in the class, maybe the first day, hand out a card and just say, um, let me know anything you think I need to know that might affect how you access this class or might affect might affect what you do in this class. And that way you might find out somebody has a disability needs accommodations. You might find out that that student that comes in late every day and you think is just lazy and running behind is coming in late because they have to pick up their kids from daycare and drop them off at home before they can get there. You know, there's perfectly valid reasons for a lot of these things that, um, you know, getting that information card can kind of help you see some of the issues a student might be having and, and, and find a way to work with those as well. 
in a physical class environment. Um, what we talk about, and this kind of can extend to some of the K-12 settings as well, is take a look at your, phys at your class. Here's a, here's a checklist that we have that we give out to instructors to kind of go through their class in, in a planning process and make sure that, there's diff that, that different things can be done to, uh, to make sure that the room is accessible. You know, you make sure the entrance to the building is accessible. That, and there's a lot of these things, something like that a teacher can't necessarily physically change. But if you didn't have a, a physical entrance to the building for somebody with a disability that you were in, then you, you need to let higher ups be aware of that so they can go about making changes. And that's not really something that we should see as an issue anywhere. But you want to make sure the entrance to the room is accessible to anybody, that you know, there's not a garbage can necessarily propping open the door that somebody couldn't work their way around, that there's not a desk right in front of the door. Uh, you, you want to make sure that there's clear paths for everybody to walk around. You want to make sure there's choices for students to s where they can sit, including those that have disabilities. You want to make sure that you know, the chalkboard or the whiteboard can be seen from every seat. You want to know emergency procedures allowing everybody to exit the room, too. What do you do if you have a student in a wheelchair when there's an emergency? How do you help that individual? There's a video out of um, Cal State Northridge, I think, where they were talking to a student in a wheelchair who uh, there was a fire drill and everybody just ran out of the room and they didn't even think about her and kind of in the panic to get out, knocked over some desks, moved something in front of the door and she couldn't get out. So if it was a real emergency, she would have been in trouble. So you want to know what the, what the process is to make sure that student gets out of the classroom. You know, you make sure that markers or chalk are thick enough and the right color that everybody can be seen, that can see them. Make sure mechanical noise is not an issue. Uh, you want to make sure the temperature is comfortable. And, and I'll tell you what, I've been a victim of this myself. I've had, I had I have summer institutes every year, and I do it, used to do them over at the union. And the first year that I did it, I didn't bother going ahead of time and checking temperature and whatnot. It was the middle of summer. I thought everything would be okay, but one of the rooms that we were in, uh, the temperature was set to 55 degrees. So half of my class was standing out in the hallway shivering and not getting anything that I had to say because they were more focused on how cold they were. So the next year, sent out an email saying, you know, bring a sweatshirt because last year we had this issue. Well, everybody shows up in long sleeve shirts and it's 76 in the room and everybody's sweating. So, you know, there, there can be a big problem if you don't have temperature set the right way. So, I mean, this is the kind of thing that we want you to look at and just think about. And make, it, it just helps you kind of think about and make sure that the classroom is uh, physically accessible before all of your students get there. And I will tell you this as well. I'll mention this now. Um, we do have a website, education.uiowa.edu slash universal access, which has a lot of this information, including this checklist that you can take and, um, and, and take a look at and actually download right from there and use it in the class if you need to. So what do we talk about with universal design in the class presentation? Well, when we talk about this, there's a couple things that we hit on, one of them being um, prepare in the preparation format, you want to determine the essentials of the class. You want to reflect on the methods that you're going to use. You want to vary these methods. So again, we're providing that multiple means of representation. You want to incorporate supports wherever possible. And, and, and try to incorporate familiar technology for your students as well. When we determine the essentials, what we talk about here and when we're goal writing is we want to talk about what the student has to know and has to be able to do by the end of the class. And then how can the student demonstrate that knowledge? So for example, you, you know, if you were a history class, if you were in a history class and, and you were learning about the Civil War and you wanted a product to show that the student had understood the issues around the Civil War, your goal probably would not have to be by the end of the class, the student's going to write a report on the Civil War. When you do something like that, when you say, you know, write a report in the goal, that's not a very universally designed goal because you're locking the student into one mode of demonstrating what they've learned. If you're really looking at universal design for learning, maybe one of the more, a more appropriate goal might be something like, uh, you know, by the end of the class, students will demonstrate an understanding of the issues leading to the Civil War. When you leave it vague enough like that by saying demonstrate an understanding, you're allowing for multiple pathways to doing that. It, it could be via writing a report. It could be doing some other type of project. It could be giving a presentation. Really, that's where we need to look at what's the essential of this class. And in that first goal, is the essential that the student knows how to write a report? In some cases, that is the case, and that's fine. But or is, is the essential that the student understands and has a knowledge on, on the Civil War? In this case, the, the essential is the understanding of the Civil War. So we want to make sure that they can demonstrate that in multiple ways, multiple means of expression at work in the goals there. 
We also want to look at varying methods. You know, again, we talked about multiple means of representation, and not everybody benefits well by sitting and listening to a lecture. So, you know, lecturing and incorporating videos, incorporating multimedia presentations, giving students choices in what they're what they're going to how they're going to access things, uh, having discussion sections, having discussions about things, uh, doing group work, doing simulations if possible. All of those things provide multiple means of representation of material, and you're more likely to kind of cast a wide net and get that information that you want out to your students if you're doing things like this. And although this is kind of aimed at um, students in a higher ed setting, the same thing kind of falls into place in a in a K-12 setting as well. The the more different ways you can provide information, the more students you're going to benefit there. So when we talk about class materials, and this really is kind of this whole thing is just kind of an introduction to UDL, uh, just giving you some ideas of it, some idea of what it is here. But UD, when we talk about uh, materials, we, we're talking about providing supports in the class, and that kind of starts with having digital text. And, and the reason we want to have digital text is because it really is accessible to everybody because there's so much that we can do with it. You think about a physical textbook. That's inaccessible to people with visual impairments that can't see the text, physical disabilities that can't turn the page, learning disabilities. It's also inaccessible to people, sometimes it's inaccessible to people that speak other languages. Sometimes it's inaccessible to people that prefer to listen as opposed to reading. But if we have digital text, we can take that and we can do just about anything we want with it. We can print Braille from it. We can turn it into audio so we can listen to. We can make a large print. We could have it read out loud on the computer. We could change the colors. We could change the background colors. We can manipulate it in any way to make it accessible to just about anybody. Also, you know, it's sustainable. It, it's something that um, that uh, you know they don't. We don't have to kill all kinds of trees printing out huge textbooks if we're using digital text. Um, if also, we have digital text, though. Uh, students that prefer to print something out and read it still can do that. It's, it's very, very versatile. So when we're talking about choosing textbooks, we want you to choose textbooks that are available in a digital form. That gives students a choice. Again, that, that's a way of multiple means of representation. If the student wants to buy a textbook, they can. If they want to download it and access it on a computer, they can. Um, you know, you, in a college setting, you want to choose your text and your readings early so that students that need to get it converted can do that. I mean, I guess that's the same in a K-12 setting because in Iowa, if you're using the Braille school or the Iowa Department for the Blind to create Braille or to create alternative text formats, they do need it six months in advance. And we want you to provide learning supports in digital text form as well. So if you're providing class notes or a syllabus or handouts, having that in a digital form that people can access on the computer or print out if they would like to is, is very important as well. You know, along those same lines when you're choosing text, another concept in universal design here, the multiple means of representation, the multiple means of engagement, is to give students a choice of the textbook they want to use. Find multiple books that provide kind of the same information. And you don't necessarily have to sign uh, a chapter then, but assign a concept that the student needs to uh, needs to have access to, and that can go a long way to kind of uh, providing multiple means of engagement as well. So when we talk about providing supports, some of the things we talk about are providing you know outlines, class notes, PowerPoint slides. These are all common accommodations for students with, with learning disabilities that might struggle with note taking in class. But if you're providing class outlines, then the students, every student is going to understand kind of the organization, the structure of the class. You're going to have a framework for taking notes if you're doing that. Um, it's going to, and all of these things, are, including class notes, they'll free up students to pay more attention and participate a little bit better in class while, um, while still getting the main information down. So this is a big help, and this is something that's real important to your students with learning disabilities that might struggle with sitting there and taking notes in class and listening. But it's also just going to help free up everybody for better discussion, better participation, better understanding of what's going on in class. and and. When you do this, if you provide class notes, it's also going to challenge you as a teacher a little bit to give the students a little bit more than what you might be providing uh, directly in notes, to, to generate uh, a little bit better discussion, to generate different types of class that then leads to maybe your multiple means of, of representation as well. Um, we talked about implementing some technologies that students might want to 
uh, might want to look at in class or using some of the, every, the everyday technology in your class as well. One of the ways to do this that we're starting to play around with a little bit is through the use of QR codes. And a QR code is what you see on, on your screen there. You see these all over the place now. Um, basically what it allows you to do is you have a smartphone or tablet. You snap a picture of that thing. It's going to take you to whatever you have linked to it. So uh, you know, we suggest maybe uh, the students are using iPads in the class. Maybe you could provide a, a uh, QR code like this that links directly to your notes or your slides or your syllabus. Um, they're very easy to make. They're free to make. If you go to qrcode.kaywa.com, um, all it asks is for a link. So if you have your notes, you put them online, you can link it on there. And then you can save that QR code. You can put it on a, on a PowerPoint slide at the beginning of class. Students can snap a picture with it. You can pass around a piece of paper with it on there. And then students can get their notes directly onto their mobile device. Uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's certainly a way to engage students a little bit differently using technology. Another way to engage students is, is through a, a tool called PollEverywhere.com. Poll Everywhere allows us to create uh, response polls and embed them directly into our PowerPoint. And what this will have on it then is a texting code. So a student would text a number and the answer that they would choose off the screen uh, to whatever number is up there as well. This is all provided through this PowerPoint. And what you're going to see that's cool is if you have Internet access, you're going to um, you're going to see the students' responses starting to appear on the screen. So it's a way to kind of tap into using the technology they're already familiar with, using the technology that they have in the classroom to, if for a good purpose, to be able to uh, take in information about what they understand. You know, there's multiple ways to use this. You could have a, a multiple choice poll where uh, you could ask um, you know, a question about something maybe you just lectured about and kind of see the understanding that the students have there. You can have a free response poll, and that's a nice way to say, does anybody have questions? And some of the students that might be embarrassed to raise their hand and ask a question could type that question out and it could appear up on the screen at the front of class. It's a really neat tool, and, and I've used it very effectively in several lectures that I've given here on campus. It is free up to 30 responses. That doesn't mean you start paying beyond 30 responses. Um, it just shuts off at that point. So if you have a small class, so uh, the free, the free um, version will work fine. And you just go to polleverywhere.com or pollanywhere.com. They'll both take you to the same spot. You set up your own account, and you've got these, um, you've got these, these polls that you can run. Uh, there is a paid version where you can get more responses out of it, or you can customize keywords there, which might be a little bit easier. But the 30 free response thing works pretty well for just about everybody. So that's, again, a nice way to maybe um, have multiple means of engagement for students and also to have um, incorporate some common technology into the classroom. I do want to take a second. I want to take you and show you a website here. Uh, this is a, a thing aimed more at your, your kind of K-12 learners. It's called the CAS UDL Lesson Builder. So what this is going to do is it's going to provide educators with models and tools to create and adapt lessons to increase access for all. So it's lessonbuilder.cast.org. I'm going to take you there real quick. We'll just go and, and I'm going to show you kind of what this is all about. So again, it's lessonbuilder.cast.org. So if we go here, you would have to set up a username and password. Let's see if I remember what mine are. And then log in. And so you're logged in, and there's three things you can do here. You can learn about universal design for learning. If we click on that to go learn about UDL, it's going to talk a lot about kind of what we talked about today. Uh, and, and this is kind of cool because they incorporate UDL right into this. When you want to learn more about UDL, you can watch a video on it you can read about it, or you can try a fun activity to kind of learn more about it. So there's building in right there our multiple means of representation. If we head back to the main screen here, you can explore what a model UDL lesson plan would look like. So if we look at this, here's lesson plans for students in science from pre-K to grade 8. And if we just choose, let's choose one of these about the life cycle of a butterfly. So this is going to walk us through. It provides us with a unit description provides us with a description for the day. 
And, it, and they've got along the side over here these little UDL connections and where those connections might be made. So if you're looking at their description of a unit and you want to see where this UDL connection is made, we can tap on that. It's going to highlight up in the unit description. It highlighted right there where it says students will engage in several different activities to support their learning and they'll have several different opportunities throughout the next two days to share their newfound knowledge. So what this does here is it shows this connection is being made in the recognition network. So here it says it represents information in multiple formats. So students will have multiple ways to engage in these activities. And the effective network. It offers students a choice of content and tools, a choice of books to study from there. And then it gives the UDL reflection. It also has a means to listen to this. So they build UDL right into this as well. If you don't want to read and would rather listen, you can click on listen and you can listen to what that UDL connection is. Let's take a look. We talked about goal writing before. There's goals here, the unit goals. Students will identify and describe the life cycle of a butterfly. Students will demonstrate the life cycle of a butterfly. Students will demonstrate their understanding that at the beginning of an animal's life cycle, some young animals represent adults while others do not. So if we click UDL connections here, it's going to show us it provides just what we talked about before. These goals provide a flex, flexible opportunities for demonstrating skills. It doesn't lock you into how they're going to demonstrate understanding. It shows, it just says it's going to allow you to demonstrate understanding. So if we go down a little bit more, here's the methods, the UDL connection within their methods. Um, is it provides multiple means of uh, multiple means of, uh, of representing what they know again. You know, a student will ask another student for a different thought and so on until students' thoughts have been represented. So that's kind of student discussion, student-led discussion. That could be um, multiple means of engagement as well. So this is kind of nice to see what a, a lesson plan would look like that had UDL components to it. And again, you can just click on all these little UDL connections and it highlights what um, is universally designed and how it's universally designed here. And it goes through the whole process all the way down to uh, wrapping up an assessment down here. And it provides materials people might need. Um, here in the books and articles, if we hit UDL connections, um, it shows us that it provides multiple different types of books or articles to look at, um, and multiple price range, multiple um, a challenge range as well for different students. If I take you back now, two levels here. I want to show you the last thing here is create and save my own UDL lesson plans. So if we go in and create our own UDL lesson plans, we can set up kind of how we want to run this. I, I haven't put anything into this, but we can edit you know, our lesson, the title, the subject, the grade level, the duration. Then we've got a unit description. So if we go to edit a unit description, we can start typing in here. And there's a little bit of a button here called the More Information button. If we click on that, it's going to provide us kind of uh, what that description is or what, that, what this is. So we can hit here, you know, if there are more than one lessons, write a unit description. You might want to include the number of lessons. It gives us kind of an idea of what we're doing here. If we go for a lesson description of the day, same idea. We, get, we can type in our, our thing. We can have more information here. And, and it should help us connect uh, some UDL options to this as well. So again, we can kind of go, go down here. If we take a look at maybe our, our unit goals, again, more information here, which provides us here with goals. It tells you kind of how you want to write these goals and gives you a lot of information about that. Um, and here, actually, it ta talks a little bit about kind of the UDL piece. A goal or objective that's confused by adding the means of achieving the goal, such as all students will write about a location, um, it, it may limit how the student's going to be able to demonstrate understanding. So it gives you some of these concepts of UDL and what to look for right along while you're building this in. So you can, this kind of guides you through writing a universally designed lesson plan. Then you can save this here. You can access it through here. You can print it out. It really is a nice tool that kind of walks you step by step through the universal design for learning process in, um, in writing a lesson plan. It's a really valuable tool. It's free. It's a free download or it's a free website. It's a free, um, you create a free um, username to get into that. It really can be a valuable tool for helping to create lessons that are going to be beneficial to everybody. You know, the next step that showed us a little bit about assignments and how to make our assignments universally designed by allowing 
multiple means of expression. Again, not all students learn the same way. So providing choice or providing multiple opportunities for students throughout the semester could be beneficial, whether that's essay, presentation, group project, other projects. So there, again, two ways to do that, providing a choice for students that they can choose how they want to, uh, what, what type of assignment they want to do, or providing different types of assignments throughout the class can be helpful there. And then assessment. The idea with assessment in UDL is that uh, you want them to be more frequent and shorter. You don't not necessarily want to just have two big exams, but by providing more frequent, shorter exams and shorter in, in length of the the, response, the, the the test itself, giving them the same amount of time to do those shorter exams could be important. Um, some of that reason for that is is one of the most common accommodations out there is uh, the need for extra time in taking exams. And what they've shown in, with some of these, some studies have shown is that if you provide extra time on an exam and, and, and not a timed test, so you know, not when you're doing, you know, trying to figure out if everybody knows their multiplication tables quickly, but in a, in a non-timed test, if you provide extra time, you, uh, it's going to benefit your students with disabilities, but it's not going to benefit your students without. Typically, your students with disabilities are just going to need more time to get their answers down. A student without disability, you either know the material or you don't. It, that extra time isn't going to really benefit you all that much. So it, when you're providing these universally designed assessments, instead of maybe two, two tests throughout the course of a semester, maybe four tests throughout the course of the semester that a student takes that has the same amount of time to do each one of those, where they focus on less material, it's going to allow the student to really show you a little bit more of what they've learned. And it also allows them to focus on less material and thus, thus probably retain more information as well. At a K-12 level, evaluation kind of needs to be consistent. You need to constantly be following up with students, you know, asking questions as assessments throughout the project, throughout the day. Um, just a constant assessment to kind of see how you're doing can be helpful. Uh, and, and that kind of talks to, uh, you know, constantly monitoring is important, but also soliciting student feedback and finding out how you're doing universally designing the class. Monitoring student engagement is important as well. On campus here, we worked with our, our group that does ACE forms, the end of semester um, evaluations for teachers, and we got questions on UDL incorporated into the pool. So teachers can go in there and choose some UDL questions and ask their students how they did with incorporating universal design for learning as well. So that's something that a teacher can do to kind of assess their own success also. There's lots of technology that can be helpful as well. Uh, the Smart Pen is really cool. Uh, it, we'll do our next demo or our next webinar on that. I'll just tell you kind of what it is and a little bit about how we used it. But a smart, the Smart Pen is a pen that's a, a pen and a recording device. So you could go into class, use a special notebook, tap on that uh, record, records what you're saying. When you write a note, it links the note to what was recorded. So a teacher could, um, or a student could then limit kind of what they're writing and, and, and listen more in class because when they go back and tap on what they wrote, it plays back from there. We did a neat project here where we gave professors those pens, had them have a different student in class take uh, notes with that each period, and then put those notes online so everybody had access. And that was a, a way that it was really a universally designed class note then. It was provided in multiple formats, written and auditory, and um, it, it provided that class support. And I'll talk about that a little bit more next month in our, in our webinar as well. Text readers can be important UDL technology to provide that multiple means of access, multiple means of representation. Nook Study is a good free one out there that students could download text into. They could download books from Barnes and Noble. They could download PDFs into that and listen to it. There's a couple of good PDF creation sites out there, or MP3 creation sites out there. The best one's probably yakitome.com, Y-A-K-I-T-O-M-E.com. Students can have texts, uh, PDFs, Word documents, Internet sites saved on their computer. They can go into that yakitumi.com. They can direct, they can be, they can direct the, the website to those, those works and then have them turned into an auditory format in an MP3 that they can download and listen to um, you know, while they're on the bus, while they're working out, or just if they had a learning disability that required them to listen or that, that they, listened, they ended up listening to their text a little bit better anyway. Um, that's got a pretty good voice too. That's a nice, nice uh, free website for creating MP3s out of text. 
You know, another tool that's out there, the PDF tool, Foxit Reader, allows you to annotate, allows you to highlight, allows you to um, extract notes that you take from a PDF. That's also free. That's also another nice technology that might be helpful in a universal design setting. Um, that's going to about do it for me today. Here's my contact info. Again, it's, my name is Jim Stahoviak. My email is james-stahoviak, S-T-A-C-H-O-W-I-A-K, at uiowa.edu. Uh, my phone number is 319-335-5280. I can be reached there if you have questions on Universal Design for Learning. We also did a Universal Design for Learning project on campus. Uh, it's called the Universal Access Project, and there's our website to that where you can find out a lot more about what we kind of talked about in our introduction here today and when we talked about Universal Design for Learning Principles. And that's at education.uiowa.edu slash universal access. So again, I uh, hope you got kind of, uh, this was meant to get you a little bit interested in Universal Design for Learning, show you some of the principles involved in this, and, uh, and maybe in the future we could go a little bit deeper into some of these things. But hopefully um, you got a good overview and you got some good tools that can help you here. But again, if you ever have questions, feel free to contact me. Thank you.